Well, tonight, the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Ghana is calling for the immediate withdrawal of a memo by the National Petroleum Authority, MPA, to all petroleum service providers to further increase some elements on the already high petroleum price buildup and fuel prices. Per the directive, the controversial boss margin has been increased. COPEC says it will not hesitate to go to court on this development because the MPA has no such authority to impose new taxes, levies or margins without the appropriate approvals by Parliament. Executive Secretary of the Chamber, Duncan Amwa, has been speaking to us. It is in respect of a memo that had been issued by the National Petroleum Authority on Friday uh, instructing oil marketing companies to charge or apply some four percent extra charge to your fuel uh, as of today, the 16th of December. Clearly, that uh, would have been the most insensitive thing for anybody to even think of, uh, bearing in mind the fact that fuel prices had gone up just a week ago and Ghanaians from different walks of life had expressed uh, some unhappiness about the way our fuel price only seems to go up and the sort of harsh implications uh, it's having on our pockets. Clearly, uh, this was coming from the back of the fact that uh, officials of even the Bank of Ghana and Ministry of Finance and some senior government officials had indicated they were going to work very hard uh, to even uh, make sure that the five pesos that was clubbed on us last week uh, gets to be uh, redrawn at some point, only for NPA to now come back to say Ghanaians should go and pay four pesos more at the pumps effective today. That clearly was going to be uh, a slap on sensitivity and again, uh, that whole action was completely illegal. And uh, we are happy with the fact that some senior government officials have stepped in and uh, the government itself has taken a decision to reverse and redraw this particular uh, move by the MP. Well, I do not think any Ghanaian anywhere, judging by the little history we've had with BOSS, uh, would say that the biggest problem for boss at present is money. The biggest problem for boss currently has to do with sound management practices. Uh, it cannot be said that all the wrong, the rot, all the plundering that has gone on at boss, uh, authorities have not heard nor seen. It cannot be said that the sort of profligate expenditure that we see uh, with boss should be allowed to continue while we come back to the trotter and taxi drivers uh, to ask them to go and pay more. All right, so that was the uh, Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, uh, Duncan Amwa, speaking earlier on the market. Please, uh, let's get some reaction to this. I'm joined in the studio by the General Manager of Communications at Boss Malika J. Thanks for your time tonight. And so the controversial boss levy, let's begin with that. I mean, for those who are watching and wondering, what is this? Tell us a bit more about this levy and what it's supposed to achieve. Thank you very much. Good evening to your viewers at this point. The Bost as a company was established in 1993 to serve as a strategic stockkeeper for the nation, mm. keeping up to about 12 weeks of fuel supplies just in case there is a, an issue with world trade and we're not getting any so we could sustain our operations and transportation in the country while that normally gets fixed. Doing that business requires the building of a number of tanks and adjunct pipelines to ensure that the product which is kept can be freely and easily transported across depots for distribution across the country. The multi-million dollar investment that goes into these tanks require periodic maintenance to ensure they don't just go rusted for the taxpayer to spend some more on it. And this was the reason why the bust margin was introduced as a levy in the petroleum price buildup to ensure that whatever accumulated at the end of the month is actually given to BOST to help with the maintenance. The last time the three pesos was agreed was in 2011. And looking at the rate of depreciation of the city and the level of inflation in the country over an eight-year period, right. the computation would just make it clear that the value of the three pesos granted as of 2011 has actually been depreciated fully. Okay, yes. here's my understanding of what took place. So it was yeah. increased in 2011, yes. but got parliamentary approval in 2017. The, the three they were collecting prior to this directive from NPA, 
mm -hmm. was actually the implementation started in 2011. Right. The six pesos per liter was approved in 2017 by parliament for implementation, but government, but for one reason or the other, had to shelf you it. You know why? I may not be in the position to tell why, but now there is the need. Much of the infrastructure at Bost is dilapidated, and when you go to the depots, while some private depots are being able to load bulk road vehicles within 30 minutes for them to move, it takes us about one or 20 minutes sometimes. The turnaround time is longer than necessary, and we lose customers to that. Okay, so listening to uh, Dan Kanamo of COPEC, he seems to suggest uh, this is not a matter of increasing the levy and that the issues that you point out have got to do with poor management. I mean, if you had sound management, you may not necessarily need to increase the levy. How do you respond to that? Uh, Duncan is actually making reference to the history of Bost as a company. You know, when things change, not everyone is able to realize it within a short period until the fruits of the change begin to show up. So I wouldn't blame him on that score. A lot has gone on at Bost as a company, but I can tell you that under the current management, Arrangements have been made and given the strategies that we are implementing with the right kind of support for the maintenance of our infrastructure and the, the upgrade of our depots, which we look forward to accomplishing in the next year. Could we are coming aboard as the strongest company in the petroleum downstream. Could, Bost, to um, could you have uh, looked at other alternatives and not necessarily increase the levies, maybe internally generated funds to sort of cushion you and make you play your role? Uh, properly. I can say Bost has been run very well over time in terms of what I know when it comes to the finances of the company. As of January 2017, a total debt of about $624 million was owed various suppliers of products to the company. As we speak today, that has been battled down to about $57 million, representing some 90.7% reduction in that. Bost has been able to use internally generated funds plus support from GNPC and the Ministry of Finance to do this much. The decision whether to increase or decrease the Bost margin does not lie with Bost as an entity. That is a policy decision, and the National Petroleum Authority, in its power and reason, saw and again, that. Kofi instead of seems to question the role of MPA in all of this, saying that it's not got the mandate to increase the levy. A is all, the, the, uh, the statement is coming uh, on the back of the fact that he is thinking there's not been any parliamentary approval for the implementation of a six pesos per liter. But in effect, that actually happened in 2017 and was shelved. So the NPA is actually triggering something which has, it has been given the authority to do all the way from 2017. Uh, and, and their concern really is the impact on the consumer because uh, just the beginning of this week, we've seen uh, an increase in the price of petrol uh, products. And so this levy is sort of creating some discomfort for uh, consumers, especially as we head into the festive season, isn't that we, something we, we want to are think talk, about? We're talking of three pesos out of uh, five. Cents, That's very significant. Per liter. That comes to about zero point five six percent. Right. That's significant. Now let me tell you this: How much it costs to build one tank farm for bus to operate runs into millions of dollars, about sixty-seven to one hundred million dollars. Right? If they, if they are not properly maintained and they rust away, the same taxpayer will be the one who would bear the responsibility of whichever loan will be contracted to put up another tank farm for purposes of strategic storage of fuel products, which we cannot do without as an economy. Great. Uh, we, we are also hearing news of uh, interventions, I'm being told. Anything you're hearing on your side? Interventions as in? To sort of uh, uh, bring down the cost, maybe interventions from government and all of that. We have not heard any such thing. We are very grateful to the NPA for the finally agreeing with us to bring the six pesos per liter to fruition. And we are promising the Ghanaian that we are going to deploy these funds to maintain the equipment at the depots and ensure we generate a level of efficiency that will give us the right volumes of business right. to make us a profitable entity, which will pay the rightful dividends to our main shareholder, which is the government of Ghana. And this will come back to the consumer who is paying the pesos today. Malik Eji, thanks for your time. Uh, tonight you have the General Manager Communications at BOSS uh, breaking down the issues for us. Thanks very much indeed for passing through tonight. So government says it has set up a committee to look into gas supply challenges which impacted negatively on Talos production targets. The challenge has forced the oil firm to revise production target for this year and 2020 significantly. Talo has blamed the challenge on the inability of government to take up its gas. But Deputy Energy Minister Dr. Mohamed Ad Amin Adam says some of the challenges could be addressed before the end of this year. The level of demand that we have, you cannot increase 
uh, gas production from Jubilee and keep the level of production from the other fields because there is no you know, demand for, for, for that. And so uh, this affects other players, you know, other than tallow oil. And so the Minister for Energy has constituted a body uh, comprising all the, the, the gas producers uh, so that we can discuss uh, a workable solution, uh, build, building consensus around that solution in order that nobody is adversely affected. I mean, certainly we need the gas for power generation, uh, but we also have commitments to the gas producers. Once they produce the gas, we have to pay. In some of the contracts, you have take or pay obligations. Even if they, they, you don't take it, you still have to pay. And that is why we are confronted with in the OCTP uh, contract. And, and therefore, uh, increasing gas from one field and reducing from another have some implications, including financial implications. That is why we need to be able to reach some, some consensus uh, before implementing whatever solution we will, we, will, we will arrive at. What will this committee be doing in terms of the pre pre presenting proposals to the minister as in the way forward or what? Yes, certainly. I mean, we want to be able to get uh, proposals with inputs from the producing companies. And there are a number of uh, proposals that have come up. You know, for example, some have uh, suggested that uh, because we are already uh, paying for the gas from OCTP, whether we take it or not, we will pay. Uh, Jubilee gas is free for now because of the foundation volumes that Ghana has been, been given for free. And so you increase Jubilee gas uh, production, reduce supply from OCTP, even though you will still pay for it, but you have been able to neutralize the composite gas price with the free gas coming from, from Jubilee. Mm -hmm. That is one. And so the benefits you drive from this proposal is that you neutralize the composite gas price with the free gas that is coming, even though you will pay uh, for what you will not consume from OCTP. But other advantages are the liquids. We get more liquids from Jubilee, you know, and therefore Ghana Gas is able to produce more LPG. Uh, to meet 50% of the, of the demand, the domestic demand. And so whichever way you go, there are disadvantages, there are some advantages. But there are other options that we may have to look at. How do we uh, uh, increase demand, for example? You know, and you can increase demand by bringing uh, industries that take on uh, more of the gas. Uh, Ghana is uh, pursuing the petrochemical uh, a hub project, which we seek to largely use uh, our gas. We are discussing with uh, other countries the possibility of exporting uh, gas to, to them. And then also there is that option of uh, reducing gas imports from, from Nigeria. The minister has already given a directive to reduce gas import from Nigeria from 90 million scarf to 30 million scarf. That frees up uh, up to 60 million scarf that we can use to uh, justify increase in gas production from Jubilee. Mm -hmm. And so the solutions are not out of, out of hand. We need to discuss to be able to build a consensus. Mm -hmm. And this is why some of us think that um, Talo uh, may have gone to the market too early to pronounce on what will happen uh, next year. Meanwhile, Talo Oil says it expects to lose about $400 million in revenue following a cut in its end-of-year projected production. The move has already forced its group uh, chief executive and director of exploration to step down. Executive Vice President and Managing Director of Talo Ghana, Kwekwa Oche, tells Joy Business new strategies are in place to turn things around from next year. So this year, uh, 2019, Talo will produce from Ghana... Um, annual average about 150,000 barrels and we will generate, this is for us and the partners, and we will generate $350 million of free cash flow. Next year, even despite revised downward guidance, we will generate $150 million of free cash flow. Now, that doesn't sound like a company that is in distress. So I would say that the numbers alone should suggest that we are not in distress. And I'll get to the second part of your question. I think the challenge and the difficulty that has occurred is that we actually forecast much higher numbers, not just 350, but 700 million, not just 150, but 500 million. And that is where the discrepancy and the challenge 
to the credibility of the king, of the company came from why did you predict this number or forecast this number when actually you're getting only 150 so it's very much about expectations and expectations management and that's where as a publicly listed company you get punished because it says you know you didn't do your forecasting well you didn't do your planning well and it raises questions but also in the news tonight, the Dubai Chamber of Commerce International Office in Ghana says trade between the two countries is likely to hit $2 billion by the end of this year. According to the head of the Ghana office, Cyril Dakwa, the country's trade relations with the United Arab Emirates this year has seen significant progress as compared to previous years. He spoke to my colleague Bismarck Awusa at the Chamber's end of year stakeholders dinner of Nice here in Accra. Even though the Ghana Dubai Chamber projected about $4 billion for 2019 financial year, it could not meet its target due to some challenges and new regulations introduced in Dubai. Cyril Dakwa is the head of the Dubai Chamber of Commerce International Office in Ghana. There's obviously, obviously been some um, difficulties uh, for local companies and this uh, came about as a result of the 5% VAT implementation in Dubai. There was a lot of confusion uh, from um, traders uh, with respect to that implementation of the 5%. So it caused um, a slowdown in, um, in trade. But we're hoping that um, once the figures um, come up at the end of this year, we will see a much better improvement on the 2018 figures, which was about $1.2 billion. So we t we're looking at probably about um, $2 billion uh, for the end of this year. For 2020, we um, aim to um, work closely with the Dubai-based companies. Uh, we're looking at bringing more Dubai companies to Ghana to interact with local companies one-on-one. -on -one. The event featured an indigenous business, Busy B. Ani winning a $10 million partnership deal to supply Ani to Dubai. Chief executive of the business, Asiome Adoboy, urged local businesses to join the chamber as there are more opportunities to expand and meet international market demand. I believe very much that most of us here have either had a chance to visit Dubai or have the urge to visit Dubai anytime soon. But if this urge that you have is to go to Dubai just for the fun, I would plead with you to have a change of mind. Because the country is a land of progressive business opportunities, I tell you. And I say this in capital letters. That is up for grabs through the Dubai Chamber in Ghana. Bismarck Ausa, Joy Business. There's been a scramble for visas in various consulates across the United States of America and Ghana's embassy in New York with over 15,000 visa applications so far uh, being processed in New York City alone since the beginning of 2019. Consul General of Ghana in New York, uh, Samuel Amwako, who uh, says there's a lot of pressure on workers to meet the huge demand for Ghana's visas, has been speaking to my colleague Charles Aite. Kenyans have not tapped into the American market. Sometimes I blame it on our level of production. Because when you get one order from the United States, one businessman cannot supply it. So I've been advising Kenyans that they must try to form partnerships so that when they get an order, they can meet the supply. Yeah, they have not been able to do that yet. Uh, there's a, a problem with trustworthiness of the Ghanaian, of the fellow Ghanaian. So if we begin to trust each other and have the, the courage to form partnerships, I think we're going to penetrate into the American markets. But we can't end this discussion without touching on the year of return. Of yes. course, it has been a huge story back home in Ghana. Okay. And I've been here since morning. I've been seeing the number of persons coming to collect their visas back to, you know, Ghana to visit the country. How has the entire process been like from your perspective? If I have to tell you, then I'll say that it has put a lot of pressure on my staff because uh, 
last year, for the whole year, were able to process about 12,600 visas. This year, I don't have all the figures, but from January to September, we had already processed 15,000. And as you might have seen yesterday and today, yesterday we had uh, 260 visa applications. And today, we had 256. So I won't be surprised that by the end of the year, we will get not less than 20,000 visiting Ghana. This is made up of Ghanaians who are naturalized in America and hold American passports. Interesting stuff. And that's Business Live tonight. Thanks for watching. More news on our website, myjoinline.com forward slash business. Thanks for watching. My name is Daryl Kyle.